Just some notes before we start today's episode. From February to May 2024, we will be doing an episode every other week as I buckle down and try and pass my last actuarial exam. And if I'm done, I never have to take a break for this, at least again. If you're an executive producer, there's also a bonus episode on the Patreon feed where I talk about our next projects for the podcast and kind of my plan to improve our audio. Uh, Thanks to those of you who listened it and upped your support. Thank you so much. Today's show is about focus, instrument practice, and paradigm, and kind of trying to make sense of it, and references the Storyteller Vault book, Prism of Focus. The book is referenced. It is by no means required to follow along today's conversation. It's just that the book is a very thorough treatment of the topic. Also, Charles was recording while tending to a baby with a cold. I tried really hard to edit around baby sneezes and such, but at the end of it, there are a few kid noises that kind of make their way through as they're just not having a great day. Anyway, with that, on with the show. Hi, Mage fans. It's your host, Terry Robinson with Mage the Podcast. Joining me today is co-host Charles Siegel, and we are going to talk about some of the ways in which you can modify the M20 focus system to work at your table. We are going to talk broadly through what some of the pain points in using the system are and kind of the ways that Charles has chosen to deal with these. This is informed by, but does not require, Charles Storyteller Vault publication, The Prism of Focus, which is a 131-page book that goes goes through all of the elements of paradigm, practice, and instrument for M20 in pretty good detail, gives a synopsis of what they are, collects it across multiple texts, and in addition to that, for every practice, gives you rotes, wonders, paradox effects, seeking recommendations, as well as, in many cases, specialty practice. And we will go into detail as to what all of those mean. Again, you don't have to grab the book and get the high-level points from these conversations, but this is kind of what it is informed by. We are also doing this discussion now because Storyteller Vault has required that titles not use generative art. This text is lavishly illustrated. A de-arted version is in the works not entirely sure when that will be out, but if you want to grab the edition that is lushly illustrated, do that now and keep it in a safe space before it is no longer available. So Charles, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Not much sleep, such as life. New member of the family. Yes. Earlier, you were, you were holding a tiny person and that can certainly complicate things. Charles, when we say issues with the M20 focus system, I, I don't want to say that it, that's bad per se. It has a lot of lifting to do. M20 is the first edition that really makes it feel like focus is intended to be the core of the game. Like, there's a lot of things to like about it. I just, my thought is that it doesn't go as far as it could, as it could have or should have, and that there are ways to enhance it. Certainly. Like, for instance, one of the things that strikes me about it is the first element of focus is paradigm, what your character actually believes. And within the book, we are given a wide number of paradigms, and they kind of break down into three classes. Those that are incredibly large and kind of obtuse, those that make sense, and then those that are more seemingly political opinions that don't actually answer the question of where does magic come from. So we're all thinking about might makes right, right? Or might is right. Uh, Might makes right as a paradigm makes sense to me in the sense that any practitioner of magic that believes that they need to show certain attributes to gain access to magic kind of would fit into that. Like anyone who practices a magical form that involves taking on a mantle, I would say mm-hmm. is is doing that. And one could argue that, for instance, what people think the hermetics are doing <laughs> might, <laughs> might fit into that. But yeah, it, and it is often the case that what is on the label, it is not obvious what it means. So like everything is chaos, you only think it makes sense, and existence is unknowable, irrational, and sublime are kind of listed as two different things. Tech holds all the answers seems to be more of a political statement as compared to a mechanistic cosmos, which to me feels like it is broader. Do you have any that you feel do a particularly good job of telling you what they are or any that tell you that, that are particularly do a particularly bad job of telling you what they are? And I'm going to throw shade on one of my favorite of the M20 books. So Rich Bastard's Guide introduced a couple of paradigms that just are complete nonsense. 
more is more. More is more. <laughs> like, yes, yes, that is very helpful. Another one that just has bugged me is how people interpret One Way Trip to Oblivion basically as the Fandy paradigm. And it's much, much broader than that. But with how the Nefandi are positioned in Mage and especially in M20, it really kind of feels like the Nefandi paradigm from the name. It kind of summarizes anything that feels that a long time ago the world was a good place or we were in a state of of goodness and it has been kind of nothing but bad since. And the well, idea of there being a fall is not unique to the Nefandi. It's also not unique to, to One Way Trip to Oblivion. We have Bring Back the Golden Age. The question is, do you think the universe has a potential for an upswing or not? Or is it about, say, having fun on the way down? So we kind of get the idea that the paradigms as listed have an almost impossible task to do that an, an attempt at coming up with these kind of pithy titles for these kind of bundles of belief is from the get-go going to be a very hard thing. How do you tend to deal with the fact that these buckets are kind of broad? Inspired by some, let's say, earlier work of yours on Storyteller's Vault, yours and Josh Heath's, the Paradigm Explored Weird and Weft, I started regularly breaking paradigms down into a sequence of tenets or axioms, just statements of belief that are much, much more specific. And I systematized it a bit in Prism of Focus. What then is a tenant or what is an axiom? The tenets are, to me, fairly simple statements that are themselves fairly flexible. Like, they, they can mean quite a few different things, you know, similarly to the paradigms as default, but they're much narrower. I needed some way to actually just, like, break down the paradigms into much smaller things that it's easier to wrap your head around and let you freeform build a paradigm very quickly. Because even characters in the books say have... I'm chaining together these like four paradigms to get to what I actually want to say, to say I believe. And trying to do that for a new character that you barely know what they're thinking because they're a blank piece of paper currently is, is a lot. Uh, so I broke it down into there are various types of tenets and every paradigm consists of at least three, one of which is a metaphysical tenet. It's how does the universe work? Things like a rational universe, which would lead you towards things like a mechanistic cosmos or tech holds all the answers or turning the keys to reality, just that you can understand how the universe works. You also have the divine is real, which gets you to the sort of the faith family of paradigms. Fall from grace, which leads you to one way trip to oblivion or bring back the golden age. It's just this is how the universe works. They're not just how the universe works, but why is there magic in the universe at all? The next thing that every paradigm must have is a personal tenet. That is, why can I do magic? Because you can look around and see that not everyone's doing it. There are things like, I am chosen, so maybe I'm God's favorite kid. Or, I have a greater understanding, which is going to be very popular with your hermetics and your technocrats. I know something that you don't, and that's why I can do this and you can't. And it also kind of answers the question of who could do it. If you say, I yeah. am chosen, only the chosen can do it. Or they need to come up with their own explanation, or their magic is something else, or what they are doing is inferior or different or, or diabolic or something like that. Exactly. Whereas I have greater understanding suggests if I could just get you to understand this, you could do it too. I don't say this explicitly in the book, but I think of I have greater understanding as the sort of paradigm that brings you a lot of sorcerers, because you may not get what's going on, but I can teach you the tricks. <laughs> and then the third one is an ascension tenet. This is, what do you think the point is? Achieve full knowledge, uh, annihilationist freedom, build a utopia. And you keep in mind, these can be either positive or negative also. Like, one man's utopia is another man's hellscape. Just ask the traditions in the technocracy's utopia. So every paradigm must have these three things. And then there are other tenets that you can layer onto it. I gave a bunch of examples like social role. Is the mage supposed to be in charge or are they a servant of the people? Epistemology, do you learn from mystical insights, divine revelation, or scientific experimentation? And scientific experimentation could also look like hermetic alchemy. It's not necessarily, say, the technocracy and the etherite. I have one for openness, hearkening back to the, I think, made storytellers handbooks talk of open and closed paradigms. As a shout out to the Akashics and the Thanatos, there's the afterlife. Do you have reincarnation or you only live once? 
as Charles says, the goal is to kind of answer the question or to help the character answer the question. Where does magic come from? Why do I get to do it? What do I intend to do it once I have it? Or what is the right nature of its usage? And more generally, what do I believe? Because paradigm is paradigm is belief. Like the, the split between paradigm practice and instrument that M20 did was great. I think that helped a lot. Splitting off, what do I believe? How do I enact it? And what tools do I use into three separate things instead of just bundling them all as I have a list of foci. One of the weird things that would happen in previous editions is you run with the problem of 1E focus is just kind of a veneer to conceal what is my greatness within. 2E starts giving us a narrower notion of no, 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 everyone believes what they're doing is the right thing. And I think Revised really made an innovation on top of that by one saying any focus for any sphere, assuming it makes sense. That was super useful. 2E kind of suggests that in the aside on magical styles, and then it gets a little bit more furthered within Sorcerer's Crusade. But one of the things that Revised introduced was the idea of the openness of a paradigm. What do I think of everyone else doing magic? And this isn't necessary, but I think it is huge for character development. One, because to me, it is something that is very likely to change over the course of play. I have strong feelings about what people call character development. I think in most cases, what they're talking about is either advancement or character revelation, where we're just learning more about a character that to me isn't necessarily the same thing. What is openness and kind of why do you think it is important when constructing a character? To tie it down concretely, you know, I have three versions of the how open is your paradigm. There's my way is right, everyone else is wrong, which can shade into everyone else's stuff doesn't even make sense and needs to be eliminated. Then you have the opposite version, which is everyone's you know, walking some path that's correct for them. I like mine, but there's nothing wrong with yours. And then in the middle, there's something like, well, mine's best, but yours is fine, I guess. Yours seems to work, certainly. <laughs> or as I like to put it, the passive-aggressive hermetic, that's great for you. I actually kind of think of that as almost like, as to some extent, more uh, very etherite. Oh, my theory's awesome. My theory's the best. I guess your theory is acceptable. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll argue about it in Paradigma, but you know, it works, whatever. And anything that allows our mages to rightly be catty bitches more, I think, generally improves the game for key moments. Especially when you have the like, oh, he's summoning that demon wearing those shoes. Oh. <laughs> that demon, that's so 19th century. Exactly. <laughs> kind of another thing that existed in revised was the notion of paradigm structure that mages generally started with a surface understanding where they don't really get into the metaphysics or ultimately they may wind up there as they realize just kind of everything works you may have a shallow understanding where you've learned to work magic by rote a strong understanding where you've deepened the connection between your paradigm and kind of the Tellurian and you start poking and prodding at the world around you and then kind of a deep understanding which is highly personalized. Do you think that it is the case that when you pick a paradigm in tenants that the character will know that or is that just information informing how they are played? Because one of the things that always got me about how paradigm is presented, if I'm playing a newly awakened character, they're not necessarily sure how any of this stuff works. The thing about the tenets is that they are high level enough. You kind of have to know if your character believes that the universe makes sense or if they're or if that God is granting magic to people. Like mm -hmm. they have to understand that much. Or at least have a hunch about it. Yeah, they have to have something because otherwise, how are they doing it? The Ascension Tenets may be the fuzziest, but like generally people who have power have an assumption about how they should be using that power. And one of the issues I had with Paradigm in M20 is it is difficult to change it. And I think it makes perfect sense that a character's understanding of the cosmos would grow and change and they would kind of blend in new elements. Whereas in M20, it kind of only presents the idea that you are constantly shedding kind of the trappings in a way that never quite makes sense to me. Do you think it's reasonable that tenants would change for a character over time? Oh, absolutely. I specifically said that you can add new tenants for free, like no XP cost for that. And that if you want to remove a tenant that has an XP cost, but it's just the number of tenants you have, and there's no mechanical advantage to having more than five tenants. So it's never going to be a super expensive thing, with the exception that you must always have 
the main three, but you can replace them at that cost too with what another. One advantage this has is it makes changing your paradigm much more modular. You can still believe in God. Instead of believing that you're chosen, you believe that, oh, I just actually had this insight into the nature of God. And that's what lets me do magic. It turns everything into sliders, which you can manipulate individually, but you can always add more tenets. Giving up a, a cherished belief, I, I decided was harder than clarifying a belief, which is how I interpreted adding a tenet. Like, well, before I didn't have any idea, but now I believe that because God gave me my magic, it is my duty to serve. You know, gets you the I serve tenet. That doesn't, you know, rock your worldview in the same way that saying, I no longer believe in God, I believe in a rational universe would. Every once in a while, I would come up with a project where I would create a flowchart of paradigms to try and like filter into them. But I quickly established the problem that whatever set of basic questions I came up with, it became very quickly circular. <laughs> and having a circular flowchart that did not have a precise beginning and end felt appropriately magey to me. I think the kind of pick and choose idea of tenets is pretty good. And again, when, when you bring this to your table, there are a set of metaphysical questions that you kind of want to have each of the characters answer that you want each player to have answer for their character. Where do they think magic comes from? Why do they get to do it? And now that I have it, what should I do with it? Again, Charles goes into much more detail in Charles's book. You don't have to get it, but if you do, that would be swell. <laughs> and one of the things I had in mind was that especially the Ascension tenets, which are, what do we do with magic? That's going to be very helpful for organizing your group of mages. Like, wherever you're coming from with how magic works, if you all agree that the goal is to make a better world, then the next problem is, how do you agree on what the better world looks like? But you're at least, you're pushing in the same direction-ish that the goal is a better world in some sense. It will inform what sorts of stories you play. Whereas if half your group says, build a utopia, and half the group says, merge with the divine, that suggests different stories than if the whole group says build a utopia. And I think kind of one of the areas with the most interesting storytelling opportunity in Mage is the fact that frequently two mages will agree on a direction but not a destination. Where it's like, yes, we want to introduce more wonder and creativity into the world, but I'm not comfortable introducing so much wonder and creativity that dragons come back and eat children. Or I, I think we need to create a less hierarchical society, but I'm not entirely comfortable with your level of anarchy. I think the fruitful area of play frequently in M20 is the fact that the traditions and the technocracy for now are directionally often looking for the same thing, especially if you consider the Nefandi to be kind of the, the prime enemy within the game. And where those two start breaking off, I think is a, is a very interesting area for role-playing. Another thing of that, can drive interesting stories is we've all heard the classic villain speech of, you know, we're not so different, you and I. It's much easier to spot the commonalities between PCs and antagonists if, oh, they share this tenet. Focus on that. And likewise, if you have these kind of things listed out for all of your characters, it gives you an idea of how do I introduce a plot element that could create interesting debate at the table or where the group could disagree in a way that is interesting. I'm a fan of how does a, a Chantry deal with a divisive external issue, as in like not just like internal politics of who do we want our new deacon to be or something like that, or, or what should we do with our note or what have you, but this opportunity has come up or this event has come up in the world and there is a genuine split over what the appropriate response is. I can't remember what book I was reading, but the author frequently said, passions run high not when people disagree, but when people agree in different ways. So the idea is the chosen one comes, we all agree that this person is important. So like there is agreement on this high destiny character that has come into our lives. You think this person is going to gush, usher in a new golden age. I think this person is going to lead us to our doom. We all agree this person We've is important. We've all seen Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> the last one was so bad. It was so bad. It retroactively made the other movies worse. Gah! Anyway, another kind of problem that I see people running into where it's not really obvious how to deal with it is paradigms feel unbalanced in, in a critical way where it's like, oh, the Technomancer can't do anything without having their ray gun on it. The chaos magic practitioner can seemingly do anything 
at any time. Anything a hermetic is notionally going to do is going to take 15 hours. Anything this Kavadi does can only be done when the gauntlet is low. Do you have any concept of whether or not there should be balance or ways to make it so there isn't a best paradigm? So first off, I think I'm going to argue that what you're talking about here is practice. And it certainly is practice in the way that I divide up the lines, but I know that the line between paradigm and practice and practice and instrument are a little fuzzy at times. And that's one of the things I also wanted to clarify. As for balance, to me, the main thing is this isn't Dungeons and Dragons. Balance means different things in different games. In Dungeons and Dragons, can kill 20 orcs in one round. If one character can do that, the other characters can't. The game is unbalanced because the game is about like killing orcs. World of Darkness, despite being a fairly heavy, crunchy game compared to most of the games that would call themselves narrative games out there, is a much more narrative-focused game. It is explicitly designed to tell a story, which means that for me, balance is more about spotlight. And that means that, yeah, it's perfectly fine if in this situation, one of the characters is, in fact, unable to help, because both the inability to help can be turned into a spotlight moment as they process that and start working through it, maybe expanding their practice or whatever. Or it can be a time to spotlight the character that can help. To use D&D as an example, you're not talking about how unbalanced it is that the wizard is useless when the rogue is checking for traps. If the hollow one is doing a quick and dirty ritual while the etherite is sitting there thinking, I don't have a toy for this. That's not necessarily a bad thing. You just have to make sure that you give the other characters a chance to have the same level of spotlighting. Yeah. And we can also get into an interesting place in that difficult to enact effect is frequently going to be rich and engrossing. And that may be a player's definition of having spotlight when they just get to go into description about what these sigils look like or the nature of the spirit that they are consulting or the trippy Steve Ditko-esque universe that they're flying through as they're attempting to scry through time. I- I'm sorry, that, that's completely ridiculous. It's, it's definitely Jack Kirby for time scrying, not Steve Ditko. So let's talk more broadly about practice then. You brought up something that I very much appreciate, which is sometimes paradigm and practice and practice and instrument can kind of blur together or it's hard to put a line between the two. So for instance, you can have a paradigm that states an element of practice. So if you have a a paradigm that says the divine listens to mortal concerns and prayer is the medium by which we message the cosmos or something like that. You're kind of defining this element within it and in the attempt to answer the question of, so why do I get to do magic? I pray, or what have you. What do you think the pitfalls people encounter with practice are? What is your advice regarding that? And how do you deal with it? So my experience is that the biggest problem people have with practice is how do I actually use this in play? Like, what does this look like? What types of effects are fitting for this practice? Converting from... I'm a chaos wizard too, so I do X by doing Y with these instruments. Especially with the default M20, I have to pick seven instruments rule, which I admit I personally hate that rule for two reasons. One is it's very arbitrary that it be seven. It's just to make the math work out on, on abandoning instruments. And two, the rules for abandoning instruments violate the spirit of everything else about the focus system in M20. In what way do you see that? The ethos of M20 to me is that faction is secondary to focus, that the game is much more focused on the people rather than the organizations in in some set, that the character is this way, therefore they are a technocrat, rather than they are a technocrat, therefore they are this way, by and large. So in M20, because things are so much focused on the character rather than the faction the character is a member of, generally speaking, throughout the book, focus replaces the things where faction would go previously. Like, if you look at the write-up of, of Sanctum, in previous editions, it says, basically, you have a hermetic Sanctum, other hermetics can use it just fine, and so on. In M- M20 does not say that other hermetics can just automatically use your Sanctum. It doesn't even imply it. It almost implies that only you can use your sanctum, which I think is a bit sketchy. But you, And you need some measurement for like how to tell when someone can use it and so on. And we can get into that in a minute. But then suddenly when you get to the abandoning instruments rules, it's, well, there's there's the crafts and seven of the traditions. And then the etherites and virtual adepts have their own rules. And then the technocracy has their own rules. And it's not based on anything about their focus. It's about which faction they align with, which to me was very jarring. It felt like there was going to be a moment where that interaction between faction and magic was going to be a good bit tighter and it was going to be much more informative 
as to how your magic worked, what group you were with. And then, as you mentioned, it ultimately kind of went this more individualistic way, but had this weird vestige with the technocracy or yeah. with technomancers in terms of dropping them. So actually, this entire project started out as a question of what should happen at high arate as you abandon instruments. So despite it being like two pages at the end, the Archmage section of Prisma Focus is where the whole thing started. And we just don't really get any information on on kind of alternatives to that. So in my formulation of practice and instruments, if you're using a practice, you can use any of the instruments associated with the practice. And you can also use other instruments if you feel like it and can justify it in the practice, but they're going to be harder. I, like if, if an instrument is not listed as related to a practice, I would say using it as expert mode for the player. Like, sure, you can use a bunch of bones to do, you know, your hypertech, but, you know, that's probably not the first thing you should reach for unless you really have some idea of what you're doing. So I abandoned the idea of instruments being what you surpass, because I also didn't like the idea of so much surpassing paradigm, because it's been made pretty clear that like that we want to have different outcomes for technocrats and mystics in some way, but it should flow from focus instead of flowing from faction. And that's actually kind of where the Ascension tenets really come in. Without getting into too much details of the system I put in place for it, you can surpass your practices instead of your instruments, where you can get the benefits of using that practice without you know, the downsides or without using the instruments if you're above a certain level sometimes. I actually followed Master of the Art and split Arc Mastery into three different paths. One is the path of the Oracle, where you never get a sixth dot in the sphere. I did not make up like what the sixth dot does. This, uh, basically, I said that if you get a di if you get to six dot, you get some basically stupid dice trick that gets you extra superpower. Like when you're using forces six, all of your successes on on our, on rolls involving forces are doubled. This seemed like a way to represent I am more powerful than normal mages are in this area without having to say forces six does X. Uh, which you know, I think we can agree with some, is probably something best left behind. behind. And just to dwell on it, uh, your options for uh, six dot are pretty cool. I like counter counter spell, which requires twice as many successes to counter unweave. The Archmaster can do two effects involving the sphere simultaneously. Kind of in mage, there's always been this hard limit of, with the exception, I yeah. think of Vormos Grand Harvester of Souls, um, <laughs> of yeah, only getting yeah. to do one. Yeah, they're, they're all some way that arc masters get to break the normal rules of the game. The one that's honestly my favorite is expend a willpower dot. The effect is permanent automatically. So if you want some weird permanent magical effect, an arc mage did it. They burned one point of willpower and then they spent like six XP to get it back because, you know, you know willpower is cheap. It, it is inspired in part by the wonder creation rules. Like if you're building a wonder that has its own magic, you burn a willpower dot. But if you want to just make the effect permanent without having to like double the number of successes or whatever, then you can burn a willpower dot to do that. Yeah. Another good fun one is area of effect because there, a player once asked me, what would I have to do to put the entire island of Manhattan to sleep for an hour? And I said, 8 million successes because that's what the rules say. And they said, that's stupid. And I agreed. There's, you have two options. And this is, this is something that's not well stated, in my opinion, in M20. One is the dividing successes. The other one is, as a storyteller, you just kind of say how many successes you need. And you scale yeah. from there. In practice, I end up fudging that a bit. But what this arc mastery does is the correspondence chart, chart for area is what matters instead of number of targets. So similarly, if you want to kill everyone in Manhattan <laughs> with forces six, you could do it. You're an asshole. But like, basically it makes that forces five nuke a much more, I actually just like ignite all of you from the inside. You're going to get technocratic arc masters showing up to kill you for that. Like, just understand, like sometimes the consequences of your actions aren't paradox. There are other people saying, dude, Sometimes Paradox is a guy with a gun. But I'd split it into the Path of the Oracle where you don't get access to these. What you do get to do is abandon instrument, abandon your practices, abandon your instruments, and just understand better the true nature of the purple paradigm. The purple paradigm being that magic is just will. Like, you, you want it to happen hard enough and it happens. The kind of annoyingly hermetic default, <laughs> as it were, uh, like, Except like for realsies instead of like, yeah, it's my will channeled through this circle. It's just like, no, 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 I just kind of do it. Oracles are, they are the goal in some sense of made the ascension. It's in the name. 
But on the other hand, if you're in it for cool powers at all, they are the least interesting. The next one is Arch Spheres, where you can get every sphere up to six. So you can get one of these special powers for each sphere if you, you know, can get the hundreds and hundreds of XP needed to do that. But you can't ever get a seventh dot of a sphere. Archimed so like Porthos is forces six. He's never going to have forces seven in this formulation. And then there's the path of the exemplar where you pick one sphere and you can go to 10, but you start losing yourself in that sphere. Like you don't have to use your instruments for that sphere. You can get multiple of these arc mastery bonuses for that sphere. But like, who are you on the other side? You're just like forces. I think one of the interesting things that was listed in Masters of the Art is the part where he said, where it says like you're only able to get quintessence by feeding directly from the shade realm. Anything else is too chaotic for you. You're like, ah, I don't get it. I forgot about that part. I would have included that if I hadn't forgotten. I may have just made it up. Um, That's still cool. Yeah. Uh, I like it. <laughs> you can become one with the sphere and go all the way with it. You can be focused on power in the here and now, in which case you know. You can still have a spread, but you can't go as deep. And then there's ignoring both and looking for actual enlightenment where, yeah, these powers are closed off to you, but you like actually could ascend. That's assuming, of course, the ascension is real and not just a thing that the tradition is made to sell more ascension. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, Pi Day is just a thing made up by four by big math to sell more math. Then the way that you get to the outcomes that are expected, which would be, say, Technocrats should almost all become Archmages. They shouldn't really become Exemplars and Oracles. It's just Technocrats tend to have built a utopia as their ascension tenet. The technocracy is a utopian organization. We may think their utopia may be bad, but it is a utopian organization at its core. So build a utopia is going to be popular among technocrats. So most technocrats who get to Arate 6 will pick the path of the Archmaster. By contrast, and exemplars are super rare, so I don't. Really, so none of these really point in that direct in that direction. But like, if you view annihilation as freedom as your ascension tenet, like your goal is to cease existing in some sense. The other things are both more attractive because ascension could, in some formulations, is non-existence. And frankly, you're not there anymore if you get to the peaks of exemplar. You are just forces now. Kind of going back to what we were talking about with with practice and some of its pitfalls, to me, it is often the case where pr that practice is where the character idea starts. Yes. Uh, frequently, it is the, the case that someone is like, I have a mage that focuses on crafts. They are a potter, or they are a gutter mage, or they are a ritualist, or they are a bard. To me, it is interesting that, that magic often starts with practice and then kind of works out from there. And I like it helps answer the question of what are the trappings of my character and what are the verbs of my character? When my character yeah. is doing magic, what are they doing? I said I wouldn't use this word, but I'm absolutely going to use this word. I tend to take a very phenomenological approach to magic. Take a drink. <laughs> but by which I mean that when the game is going, I want you to describe what you do. You can explain to me why you believe that doing that will work. But at the end of the day, the important thing is when everyone's looking at you, what do they see? That is the direct input that the other characters have to play off of. That's the thing that the NPCs have to respond to. And yeah, I don't tell you like, oh, the NPC, because they believe that X, Y, and Z, they do what they do A, B, and C. I just say the NPC completes the circle in, in chalk on the floor and starts chanting in Latin. What do you do? That's practice. That's where practice lives. I actually originally was not going to address paradigm in this book until it felt, just felt very incomplete without it. And we had been discussing the tenets for paradigm explored books more and more. And I kept thinking, there's got to be a way to, to make this into a systematic approach to answering what the most important questions I see for a mage are. I like making big, complete, comprehensive projects that are kind of what I have to say on this subject, and I can then move on. Here is all of it. This is what I think about it. Good day. You may have noticed I have a tendency to write some of the longer vault supplements. Yeah, uh, comprehensive, um, I think, would be a yeah. reasonable adjective. Yeah, that that's what I go for. But practice is the thing that, to me, is the most important. And another place where I think that the M20 focus rules could have been better because I don't want to sound like I hate the M20 focus rules. I just think that they didn't go far enough in the direction they were already heading in. They should be speared through everything in the game. Focus is the core of mage. And there's so many things that 
if you have a slightly more robust focus system than M20 provided, suddenly you can clarify what the mechanics for a lot of things should be. Like part of my solution was focus now has ratings. I took Go and Hypertech out of being abilities and just said, no, no, these are practices. Do is a specialized form of martial arts and Hypertech is literally a practice. And so they have ratings from usually one to five, Arc Masters can have six. And that, that tells you, you know, how good you are at this practice. So it caps what spheres you can use that practice with. You get a free practice dot with each point of arate because I didn't want it to be super expensive. If you're going to be narrowly focused in one practice, you never have to spend anything on practice. But then I said, now that practices can have ratings, what can I do with that? And I said, well, what if I give practice ratings to places? hey, now we can have mechanics for reality zone. Well, this reality zone has gutter magic three, which means that in it, gutter magic effects up to sphere rank three are coincidental. Or this one has hypertech negative three, a shorthand for things that are three, four, and five with hypertech are now vulgar automatically. So things get vulgar from the top and coincidental from the bottom. So then what is a sanctum? Well, for each dot of sanctum, you can add a plus one and a minus one to some practice for that location. A reality zone can just be any mess you want. Like ST just makes it up, whatever. A sanctum is a special type of reality zone. So you're a hermetic, you're building yourself a sanctum. Let's say you, you buy yourself a five point sanctum, then you probably want to say high ritual magic five and like maybe hyper tech negative five so that the techn technocracy shows up and their freaking mirror shades are vulgar. Meanwhile, you can summon the elemental fire from hell and, you know, oh yeah, no paradox. That's not a problem. And this also really gives you some good mecha some mechanics for why don't you attack someone in their sanctum? M20 sanctum was a little bit less rigid. I don't, I'm not using rigid negatively. Just It was a bit less rigid mechanically than say revised sanctum, which was, oh, you're a hermetic. Okay. Hermetic magic is coincidental. Everything else is vulgar. Whereas M20 sanctum seems more like a well-stocked laboratory than a piece of reality that makes things easier for you. And I bring that back. Another question that comes up at the table a lot. I'm doing a big ritual. Can he help? And the answer I end up giving is yes. And he's more helpful the more he understands about the practice the ritual is being done in. And I think another thing that the, the kind of focus on practice does is it. I don't want to blame Christianity for this. But it seems to have this weird degree to which it presumes that belief is the driving force in people's lives, more so than I think it is. Like, there are any number of cultures and worldviews where, like, the Romans, to some extent, didn't care if you believed in the gods. But if you didn't make the offering, bad things were going to happen. I don't care if you believe in Pallas Athena. But if you don't drop off that pomegranate, our city's boned. <laughs> yeah. If you look globally in terms of number of cultures as opposed to number of practitioners, orthopraxy is much more common than orthodoxy. And what is that? So orthopraxy is right practice. You have to do the thing. Orthodoxy is right belief. You have to believe the thing. There are only like three like orthodox religions that I can think of, but they are the three biggest religions in the world. You know, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, most traditional and, um, you know, tribal religions and so on are orthopraxy. There's basically no orthodoxy before Christianity. It was an innovation, it was an innovation that for better and worse. And yeah, mage is influenced by that because mage is largely written by people living in societies dominated by orthodoxic religions, which is almost every society on earth these days because Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism. This is not a negative. Like, this is just a statement of history. And, and it's also a, a generality. For instance, I was raised Catholic, which I would argue was orthopraxic. <laughs> Mom, I don't believe in God. I don't care. You're going to church. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, and from a strict point of view, Catholic Catholicism is kind of straddling the two. You have to believe the right things too. Like, is like that's part of the doctrine. You have to believe the right things. And it is often the case of a orthopraxic culture where orthopraxy comes out of the fact that the orthodoxy is presumed. For instance, you have a lot of ancient cultures where the notion of believing anything else was just not even a concept. Where, of course, everyone believes that Anana is within this temple. The question is, how do you show worship? So 
if nothing else, we are, it is a interesting axis along which to consider what people do, especially if you're from a culture that is primarily one or the other. It is a interesting other way to see how one defines right action and right belief and whether or not you actually care about those. So there's definitely all those influences floating around it going into Mage. And, and yeah, I focused on practice. I come from a primarily orthopraxic culture. Computer scientists. Oh, God, no. That's an orthodox. Okay. <laughs> you better believe that JavaScript is garbage, which is correct. And you better believe that people who program HTML are not programmers, even though it's Turing complete. Another thing that that your text does that I think is, is pretty great is it uses practice as the guide for both seekings and paradox. Why do you think that should live there? It's, again, that phenomenological approach. Like, what is actually happening if you're an alchemist and you screw up in some way, that should look different than if you are a faith healer and you screw up in some way. And so that's paradox. Like if you're an alchemist and you take damage from a paradox backlash, the most logical way to make that physical is your glassware exploded and you got shredded by it. Whereas a faith healer might just have stigmata. You can, with some interpretations of paradox, say, well, the alchemist is getting stigmata because paradox is, is kind of like that. But I'm not a fan of that. I tend to like it so that things make sense to an outside observer if to some degree. Like, I don't like paradox making the world weirder. I like paradox operating within the rules in order to do things. And as for seekings, part of why I was able to focus entirely on how practice can inform seekings is because I knew that at the same time that friend of the show, uh, Puka, was working on Paradigm's Progress, which is about how paradigm can uh, influence seekings. I personally feel like both should work, but because I also, I generally took as practice is the core of magic to me. If you are primarily an alchemist, because maybe you have other practices too, but maybe this is the core one that your identity is built around, then your seekings, which are supposed to lead you somewhere, should follow the steps of alchemy. And it's like, I go into that for each, for each practice, what sorts of symbolisms and so on you can pull from. And I admit that some of them are much more detailed and concrete than others, but that's just because I could not do the level of research into that meant that many practices that I've done previously into a few of them. Yeah. And kind of another thing that multiple practices get you is closer to that real life experience. Like the one that came up to me when I was writing the Celestial Chorus for Lore of the Traditions is a lot of people pray or do something that looks awfully like prayer, despite everything else that they do. And it felt a little restrictive that my etherite who has weird science couldn't also believe that the Jesus was our Lord and Savior. Well, you can, because M20's focus rules say you have at least one practice, but then you have to pick your seventh instruments. Seven is both too many to pick individually and not enough to cover your character. Yes, but it just felt like that the, the rules as written always kind of focused on these very narrow mages that had one kind of unitary belief in the world. And even if it paid lip service to a multiplicity of it, none of those complicated characters that reflect real world belief were really kind of brought up. Most people out there have no idea, say, how many Orthodox Jews are methodological mat materialists and, uh, and scientists. Like, it is very easy to have a character with you know, to stick with this general vicinity of examples, weird science three, faith two. Like, yeah, they can't do the things with faith they can do with science, but they can do a little bit. And it also is always nice to be able to uh, almost literally pull a miracle out of a character, as it were. So I, I think that's a good good point to progress into instruments. What is the, the line between, roughly, between practice and instrument, and how do we make them interesting, varied, and useful? For me, at least, the line is that a practice is something that comes with there are multiple abilities, generally at least one from each of the three columns that are relevant to the practice. Like one of the things I did with practice was inspired by Doe. You have to have a certain number of, of ability dots before you can in relevant abilities before you can increase your practice. Like you can't have hyper tech five and technology zero. That character is nonsense. We just don't do that. We don't do that here. But say a gun is firearms. It's an instrument. It is there's not a practice of gun. Sphere, yes. Yes. Practice no. <laughs> so that, that's kind of where I think the dividing line is that if you can look at the practice and see, well, there's a talent, a skill, and a knowledge that are relevant to how I would go about, you know, using this in my life. And even if that knowledge is like, oh, so this is some weird specialty in esoterica or, or whatever, then yeah, sure, go for it. Then you are 
pretty confident that you are sitting on a practice, not just an instrument. But like, say, circles, okay? What, what, what talent is circles? Okay, you can, you can tell this is not a practice, this is an instrument. Don't say it too loudly or it's going to turn into a secondary, okay? That's all I'm asking. <laughs> Whereas you could argue that, say, martial arts is an instrument because there's a skill, but then you look at the eight limbs of dough and you see, well, you've got meditation, you've got alertness and awareness, you've got esoteric body control, you've, you've got this, you've got that. That makes martial arts into a practice that it is a bigger thing than just like the specific tool that you are using. Yeah, I know you agree. Yeah. <laughs> and Mage especially has so many skills and talents and knowledges that you can find them for a lot of things. I personally, I think that the uh, abilities list should be trimmed, but I also want to encourage players to spend points on abilities and having a million of them makes that makes that harder, not easier. Uh, so what is your approach to the question of helping players figure out what instrument is appropriate or alternatively, is that even a valid question? Because the thing I always hated, and we may get into this next, is the notion of at least when focuses are tied to spheres and you drop them, it's easy to tell if you would have used it or not. M20 kind of makes that complicated. What is your guide for figuring out what an appropriate instrument is? Well, so as far as the dropping instruments, we already kind of covered that. I dropped practice instead of instruments so that it's not, well, I don't need to use this instrument. It's I can now get the benefits of this practice without doing it, without like physically doing anything, or I can get a bonus for doing it anyway. My way of tackling that was always not that you dropped instrument or practice, but that at Arite 3, you, you no longer needed a focus for level 1 effects. At Arite 5, you no longer needed it for level 2. I also pushed all of that to the Arite 6 horizon because I just don't like it for um, player characters by and large. Unless I'm running a game about that. And kind of under the default rules, it specifically says you maintain your paradigm, practice an instrument, but you don't need the instrument and you become the instrument. And it's like, wait, what? If I believe that all power comes from intercessory prayer or something or beseeching the divine, how am I? I don't know. Like in a bunch of cases, it yeah. just didn't make sense. Yeah, and, and the intended way to interpret it in my system is that, okay, so you have got a high enough arate that you no longer need need your practices for first dot effects. Let's say stick to the faith practice for, you know, intercessory prayer. Maybe God has just granted you the ability to just do this. Or maybe you have gotten to the conclusion that I still need God. I'm the one doing this. God's helping me when I pray. I don't spell any of this out because that's so character specific. Like that would be easily another seven to 8,000 pages. My approach to helping people figure out what instruments they're using is actually to focus on those abilities as part of the uh, general practice rebuild. So in Enlightened Grimoire, I included the, a version of rules for rotes. These were very general rules. They didn't tie very much into practice directly, but it was there were some implicit ties. Here, I explicitly tie roads to practices and say that that roads have the advantage of, because if I'm going to charge XP for something, it has to give you some kind of mechanical advantage. I'm old school like that. If you pay for something, it should be worth something. And one thing I said was that what roads do is they get you a bigger dice pool. Roads, instead of using Arate, use attribute plus ability. And it should be the attribute plus ability that you would roll if this were being done successfully by a mundane person. Okay, can you walk me through an example of that? So you're a hermetic, say if you're a hermetic building a fireball rose, you're a member of House Flambeau and you have one idea. I love House Flambeau, they have at least two ideas. They can also freeze things. They do it with gusto. So you know, you got your forces three prime two, that, that stuff's all fairly standard. But how are you actually doing the rote? Are you, you say you are performing some occult ritual so maybe your ability, the ability that you're rolling is going to be a cult. It might also be high ritual magic, which has been an ability at various times, but it tends to have more to do with like how long you can work than anything else, than how much you know, which is kind of a strange ability, but you know. And I feel like in one of the cases where it was brought up as a secondary, like five dots was excellent party, Martha. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> Cultist rituals, they're weird. Yeah. Um, so there's a bunch of different abilities. Like, really, it's look at the list of abilities for your practice and pick the one that feels the most appropriate for what you for how you want your character to actually perform the effect. Pick an attribute that seems relevant to what you are describing. Traditionally, fireball stuff tends to be either dexterity, if you're talking about like how carefully you're drawing a circle or whether or like you're actually like throwing the ball of fire. 
or it's intelligence if it's like you have to write the exact correct symbols or this is how you get roll dice pools of dexterity plus occult was it, it was either dexterity plus occult or intelligence plus occult was the default dice pool for hellfire in sorcerer previous you know in previous editions so you know not a shock that that's that that's a reasonable role for a fireball effect for the order of hermes meanwhile if you're doing the similar forces three prime two i hurt you a lot with fire effect and you're a member of iteration x you're much more likely to be doing say dexterity plus energy weapons or dexterity plus technology or you're probably going to be throwing dexterity in there because your worldview requires that you aim whereas the order of hermes can attack your pattern directly with how they understand the world and i just like the idea of bringing down that god ray to, to smite someone and rolling charisma plus meditation or whatever deemed <laughs> deemed to be appropriate there Yep. One thing I like about this system, like this is a system that I have tested, I, I use it in my own games, is that a starting character with Arate 1 can still be like the best guy in the Shantry for perception effects. If their perception plus occult pool is 8, then their one dot effects that have perception plus occult is their dice pool. They're the guy. Like They're not useless when they're surrounded by Arate 3 and 4 characters. They might still be the best at something. Which by the default rules, okay, they have one die. They are the worst at everything. And you have a 10% chance of botching. Hooray. But if you let them, okay, they have this one thing. They got a rote for it. So now they have eight dice for it instead of one. No one else in the Chantry has this road, or even if someone else does, they have a lower dice pool in it. If they have a problem that requires that you understand, you be able to see this, or, you know, this thing, you're the guy. Like, Arc Masters might show up at your house and say, you are the expert at reading radio waves from the air. Tell me what is happening. Yeah, nothing quite like an Arc Mage showing up at your house asking you to, do, to perform your rote for them to be a plot hook. Dance monkey. Yeah, it also reminds me of like when colleges give credit for like life experience where it's like, yes, I don't have the same formal education as you, but there, it, I, I do bring things to this party that are quite useful. And there are any, any number of systems have been proposed as a way to, to deal with rotes. Yeah, I, I've proposed two of them. <laughs> I do like this one better. I also require that starting characters start with six points of rotes and a point is equivalent to like a sphere dot in the rote. That means that at starting, you have to say, this is a set of a couple of effects that my character is especially good at. Knowing what your character is good at and knowing what your character is bad at will make things go a lot faster in play. Like if your character has that forces three prime two effect and like a one dot perception effect as they're starting roads, your character is probably going to pick fights more often than other characters <laughs> would because you are good at fighting. Whereas if your character has a mind to calm someone down effect you're probably going to stop fights a lot and if you have a correspondence three teleport rote then you are going to run away and the thing is this tells you a lot about the character like what they are good at is what they have practiced it is what they are looking to do in the future and, and this is all separate from oh rotes having an effect means that actually finding a book with a weird rote in it is a valuable thing for the mage as far as magic is concerned, without a system like this, there is no reason for the average mage to ever increase in the attribute or ability from a strictly magical point of view. All your XP should be going to spheres and arate if you want to become more powerful magically. And this provides a different avenue that means that spending XP on attributes and abilities is worthwhile. It encourages XP spread for away from spheres and arate, which are super expensive. It avoids that problem of the etherite with technology zero because like, Okay, who gives a shit what their technology score is? And and there's some words in M20 about, you know, might have to have abilities at this level in order to do that effect, but it's a very loose system. Oh, if you don't have that, I have to say no, rather than this system, which is, oh, you have that, I get to say yes. The other thing I like about what you're proposing is it allows for specialists, which is something that I think any game that has wizards should have the person that is exquisitely skilled at a small number of things and that is just their deal and this allows us to have some very specialized characters a character that is very good at creating binding oaths they have the appropriate number of dots in manipulation plus law and they just kind of officiate them you can have your everything go kaboom fire mage you can have your and this is something i would see as being huge within the technocratic union the character that can safely navigate moving into subspace or moving into ensemble space is now something like no we're not going to make the jump to hyperspace unless we're being piloted by 
this character. Yeah, the, the specialization is another aspect of it that's really, really helped. In Revised, back where each tradition had a specialty sphere period and that was it. Every tradition book gives you examples of, here's what you do for a game of like five hermetics. And then you're like, okay, but like everyone has forces three. These guys have basically the same stats, okay? So like this is going to be a very boring game and it's going to be hard to let anyone really shine if everyone can do what everyone else can do. But then you throw in a rote system like this and suddenly... Okay, you both have forces three, but you're a sound mage, and he's a fire mage, and those are different. So most of this conversation, Charles and I have been talking about the general aspects of paradigm practice and instrument and how it informs focus. And now we're going to talk about one or two things that are more specific to Charles's text. Again, the discussion has been framed by Charles's book, Prism of Focus, available at the Storyteller Vault. Again, most of the high-level points we've gone over, but there's beauty of this text is in the sheer volume of detail and how fun it is to just thumb through it. This is not a book that you need to read from front to back. And two things that you introduce are are kind of group specialties as well as corrupted practices. What are those? What are one or two of them? So I'm going to start with corrupted practices because, so it's no secret that I'm not the biggest fan of Book of the Fallen. One of the things that annoyed me about it was that the practices that were described in it were just like, Infernal Science is just like hypertech, but, but evil. evil. <laughs> and like Black Mass was like faith, but, but evil. evil. <laughs> and I thought, actually, that's a useful concept. Like what if you're just, doing like the evil destructive version of this thing. So instead of making them separate practices in and of themselves, I came up with the concept of the corrupted practice, which is just, what if you're basically using the practice for evil? Why would you do this? Well, you get some additional benefit and there is a cost, but that benefit can be tempting. And the downside is that eventually you can't use the practice without doing the corrupted version anymore. Yeah, one of the things that always bothered me in Mage was the fact that the Fondi are listed as powerful. We never got an answer to that question as to why. Sometimes we got the idea of demonic, demonic investments, which were actually like a pretty crappy deal through, through uh, most of it. Terrible deal. Oh, yeah. Uh, they're, they're, they're a really great deal for the Nefandi to make their followers take. Yes. They're a great deal for an NPC where no one has to do the accounting. And you could just say, yep, this is who they are. And then later we kind of get the idea that the fact that they're willing to do anything is a benefit. But I don't know. I've met a lot of mage players, and I think sometimes their choices would make them the Fondi Blanche. To provide a mechanical benefit to that is, is kind of neat. Can you give one example? Uh, so basically all the ones I did were, I just sorted the practices in uh, Book of the Fall and so, you know, to say Infernal Sciences, which is a corrupted version of hypertech, though I, I'm not going to yell at you if you say, well, you can also get there from weird science. Sure, fine, yeah, whatever. Go nuts. Yeah, have fun. I had to pick a place to put it in the book. Kind of what is the benefit of using that corrupted practice? If you cause a health level of damage to an unwilling victim, you get minus one difficulty, minus two if you kill them. Yeah, that, that's pretty so, useful. <laughs> so, like, if, if you want to fuel your weird science device by, like, shoving electrodes into an orphan, you get a difficulty break. You're a bad person. I was about to say, this sounds like a great justification for my longtime favorite, the orphan-powered space laser. So... <laughs> Yeah, the cost of it is that um, you start losing the ability to do non-infernal science as you go. For infernal science, it's even beyond magical techniques. Even mundane science and technology rules are penalized if you're not directly causing harm to others. But again, if you're doing this enough, that's not going to bother you. Yeah, the bug is a feature. <laughs> If you start taking advantage of this difficulty break, you start losing the ability to do regular science, including scientific magic, and your practice becomes about actively harming others. You know, once you are doing that, once you're doing that to a certain point, the calls are a much smaller step than they used to be now, aren't they? And then what is a specialized practice? So a specialized practice is the benefit you get for being a member of a group. Like you can be an orphan, like the system works fine for orphans. It's designed to, to work fine for everyone. If you can do everything just fine, why be a hermetic? Why be a member of the children of knowledge? And the answer is that that is specialty practices, which you can only get either as a member of a group or by being very carefully taught it by a member of the group, which they generally don't do. You know, think like Akashics and Do, which is the specialized version of martial arts that Akashics have access to in this formulation. It replaces the regular practice it, so whenever you would have a role, have something that depends on the martial arts practice, if you have the Doe practice, you're fine. You use that instead. Doe is kind of the paradigm example of this, where it's martial arts, 
but better. So the specialized practices just get you an extra advantage when using the practice. Martial arts, if you're using the martial arts practice, you can do lethal damage instead of bashing damage with a martial arts, with martial arts attacks. With Do, you actually get a lot of benefits because like there's the Do maneuvers and so and so on. But uh, generally for each practice, you have a, some thing that the practice is good at and something it's bad at. I'll use alchemy as an example because alchemy was the first one that I wrote. So it's the one that became the thing that defined everything else. So with alchemy, you have the benefit that when you make charms, you only need to use half as much tasks because a task for quintessence, because you're just what you are good at as an alchemist, you make charms. It has the penalty that you are bad at fast casting. All improvised magic is at plus one difficulty. And this also helps guide alchemists to what is their niche in the group? Like the alchemist is going to make healing potions. They're not good. They're not going to, you know, on the fly, figure out how to like burn the house down, but they might have formative mercury. In yeah. Yeah. They, they, they may have the mundane knowledge to, to burn down the house. Whereas the children of knowledge have the Royal art, which is another name for alchemy historically. Uh, one that pretentious alchemists like using. So I used it for the children of knowledge and it has the benefit of being able to make unexpected components work. You can produce charms using any quintessence or task. If you need charms made in a hurry, no one is going to do it better than the children of knowledge who can just like, I've got some quintessence. I can make whatever you need. Whereas even your hermetic alchemist is going to be like, well, I need appropriate resonance on the, on the task, but I need less of it. And then like, the hermetic high ritualist is going to be like, well, I need a ton of quintessence and tasks. This is going to be hard. If you are planning to build a lot of charms, it might be worth it to learn the alchemy practice or make friends with your local child of knowledge. So these just help specialize the practices and tell you what is this good at? What is this bad at? High ritual is going to be bad at, bad at doing things very quickly, but it's going to get all sorts of benefits for rituals. Hypertech is good at making permanent wonders rather than gadget, gadgets, charms. I like that hyper economics lets you kind of treat a group as a person to be like, yeah, I'm going to manipulate a few hundred individuals rather than just this one using art of desire. Yeah. And before the development of hyper economics that makes the syndicate the syndicate, you could manipulate this guy. Now you can manipulate markets. Yeah, these people. My intention was to also help clarify what these factions do. Like Iteration X has the specialty of integrative technology. They put the technology into that. The syndicate has hyper economics. They manipulate markets. The Taftani have weaving. Which Taftani, according to Lost Paths, I've never checked, so I can't vouch for it. Taftani means weaver. So, you know. You get what you get. Functionally, it makes it their minus one difficulty for vulgar magic. It doesn't affect paradox, but this kind of helps explain maybe why they tend towards the extravagant. I am hoping that I got that, you know, with some of the specialties for the crafts, I got words right. If I got them wrong and someone knows, let me know and I will, fi I will fix it. Like the high ritual magic specialty of the Nagoma, which I called Nyeredzi, is a Shona word for stars and astrology, which is the focus that I went with because I looked into great Zimbabwean ritual magic and it looked like it was a lot of astrology. You know, I did my best as a single person doing research on my own. I try to put in a lot of both player and ST helpful goodies for every practice because as I said, this started out as being intended to be basically a book of practices and everything else kind of, it started off as what happens to instruments when you get to high arate, then it became book of practices and then it became well, while I'm here. And then it became M6. <laughs> Again, the book we're talking about is Prism of Focus, available on the Story Tower Vault. Please go there, grab this work. If you found our conversation about it compelling, grab it now while the full art version is still available. There will be a new version eventually, but for posterity's sake, it's nice to have the other one in your uh, super secret PDF vault should you want to see the original illustrations that came with it. Some of them I'm very proud of. Like there's a glitched out piece I put under cybernetics. Yeah, under cybernetics next to digital hellscape paradox realm and the piece next to sheet music of creation for, for bardism is another favorite of mine from, uh, from inside the book. And it's all AI generated because I can't afford to commission this much art. I'd have to sell 10 times as many as many books in order to come close. Yeah, generally I need to sell 75 copies to pay for a cover illustration and most texts don't make it too much past 75 copies. So yeah, kind of gives you an idea of the, <laughs> the economics yeah. there. Yeah, the, the economics just don't really work out, if, especially if you have anything more that's more specialized than what either the art packs or free art can ha can handle. And then there's all the questions of, well, the sites that host free art, 
the cover of uh, Number and Shape had to be changed for that reason. When you found out after the fact that the item that was purportedly available for use was yeah, not. That was one of the things that started me getting into um, AI art from the user side as opposed to the AI researcher side. Yeah. Charles, thank you so much for joining. Is there a next uh, publication we should keep our eyes peeled for? That's a good question. I'm currently kind of evaluating how I'm approaching Storyteller's Vault stuff, given the art to the art difficulties that I don't trust the CC0 sites, because like those pictures are often literally stolen and AI art being banned. And I really don't want to be spending, you know, 30 hours poring over public domain art that doesn't form any sort of coherent appearance for the book. So I'm figuring out what I'm going to do there. Updates will be on my Patreon, which is at Charles M. Siegel. You know, I'm, going, I'm planning to contribute writing to some projects that other people, you, know, you, are leading. And I'm available for freelance work. Hint, hint. And Charles' contact information and link to the Patreon will be in the show notes. Charles, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been Made to the Podcast, where the audience is always the focus of our practice. The show is made possible by our executive producers, who include the oracles of the following practice. Ben Bendelow, Oracle of Galchemy, knowing how to mix cocktails for your best gals. Buck Gregory, Oracle of Bibernetics, add-ons that make you maybe play both sides of the field. Christopher Phillips, Oracle of Kraftwerk. Not pottery, but the German band. Guy Stewart, Oracle of Medium Ship, which is using something smaller than a battleship, but larger than a destroyer in all of your magic. Jay Widener, Oracle of Yogurt. Culture Dairy improves everything. Joshua Hillrup, Oracle of Hypertech, which is technology for people on the ADHD spectrum. Mikhail, Oracle of High Ritual Magic, where you just do a massive edible and talk in Enochian. What could possibly go wrong? Pukaji, Oracle of Lardism, the belief that animal fat makes superior biscuits. Sean Gallagher, Oracle of Reality Smacking, where you just kind of slap reality until it does what you need. Crew of Erebus, Oracle of the Cart of Desire, a nice wheeled ox cart containing everything you ever wanted. St. UX player, Oracle of Manimalism, proving all those weird products on alpha male podcasts actually work. Sorcerer Sanguine, Oracle of Lazy Wisdom. You know, changing reality or don't. I'm not your boss. Along with Archmaster Andrew Adelstein, Archmaster Brad the Blue, Archmaster Dan Svensson, Archmaster Derek Semsek, Archmaster Leroy Borais, Archmaster Michael Parker, Archmaster Morgan Aran, Archmaster Nathan Weaver, Archmaster Wolf Larryson, Alex, Alexia, Ambiversion, Andrews S, Anon, Baderfi, Birdo, Blaze Hibbert, Blake Ryan, Brandon, Bryce Perry, Bubba the Pale One, Chris Blake, Sinchotis, Daniel Cuppin, Daniel Scribner, Darren Hennessy, David Roy, Dennis Osborne, Eli Levenger, Eric Schwenk, Fraggerock, Friedrich Owl, George Laura, Henry Kraft, Ia Bolt, Jason Kennedy, Jason Vines, Jason W. Briggs, Jay Gatsby, Jeff Wren, Jenna F., Jervis Johnson, John Magnuson, JoLynn Andes, Laws and Stuff, Kathleen Halperin, Chris Kinner, Leslie Weatherstone, Manel Kenos, Matthew Prohl, Michael Creedle, Nabero, Neil Patterson, Nikita Klamanov, Oliver Schindler, Patrick McNamara, Patrick Mulder, Rachel Grace, Ricardo, Richard Bat Brewster, Robart the Robot, Rubem Joseph, Ryan Stray, Rob H., Ryan Kendi, Samuel Tobin, Sev Nessus, Starfish, Stephen Carton, Thrice Great, Vincent Hamilton, Walter, William Connolly, and William Martin. Our EP shout out this week is to Manel Kenos, whose last name I interpret as Ken OS, but I couldn't find any weird operating system, so here are some weird programming languages. Whitespace is an esoteric programming language that ignores all non-white space characters using only space, tabs, and line feeds for its syntax. Ook Ook, a programming language inspired by the behavior of primates, particularly orangutans. It only has three keywords, which are variations of the word ook with exclamation marks. Despite that, it's Turing complete. Malbolge is considered one of the most difficult programming languages to write and understand due to its intentionally obtuse design. It was created as a challenge to create a programming language that was extremely difficult to program in and seems to have met that challenge. Piet. Piet is a programming language that uses graphical images as code. Programs are represented as abstract geometric figures, and the interpreter navigates through the images, executing commands based on the color and shapes it encounters. When I think of esoteric programming languages, I'll think of you, Manel. If you super liked this episode or super didn't, drop us a line at magethepodcast at gmail.com or at magethepodcast on Twitter. We have a hop in Discord community at discord.me slash magethepodcast. Mage the Podcast is also on Mastodon at dice.camp slash at magethepodcast. If you like us, Please give us a review on the platform you're choosing or tell a friend about us. Also go to matesthepodcast.com for show notes and all of our previous shows. Now go change reality. Bye.